Regarding sets, it's important for us to mention right away that they're two very similar looking notations. And for these slides, we'll just call them type 1 and type 2. So we'll talk about, while they look similar, they really are different. So we have to know how to tell them apart. Um, that will be super important. And then for type 1 sets, uh, then we should talk about, well, what the heck is it saying? How do we read what it says? And then based on how to read what it says, how do we prove that something is in type 1? How do we use that something is in a set of type 1? And then we should do the same sort of thing for type 2. So let's just dig in. So there, these look really similar because there's curly brace uh, at the front and at the end of both types. There's a colon in the middle or there's an alternate symbol that could be used. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but type one, before the colon, you have just a variable in set. So it might be, you know, um, little m in uh, real numbers right here, or, you know, like, and the, the thing is in type two, the ending looks like that. Um, and then after the colon in type one, you have a condition which mentions the variable that's right here. Um, in the case of type 2, the thing before the colon is an expression that mentions the variable that was right here. So this all looks a little confusing, but let us go ahead and, and just state examples here. So here's a set called A, here's a set B. Um, this set right here is an example of this, because look, you've got variable in set right there, x in z, variable in set, and then here's the condition that mentions the variable. So the variable is x, and the condition here is x squared plus 1 less than 30. Now that could be true, that could be false. It's, it's, so it's a condition, right? It, 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 is it true or is it false? Well, that depends. That depends on what the value of x is, right? So that's, um, I hope just by showing this example, it puts some clarification to what we meant by condition mentioning variable. The second type, here it is, so set um, before the, so right after the cr first curly brace and then right before the colon you just see 10x plus 3. That does not look like this at all, right? So this is, over here it was variable in set, right there 10x plus 3. After the colon you have this x in z which looks very much like what's right here. So so in type 2 you actually have to read this the part after the colon first. You have to go x in z and then look at this 10x plus 3. We have a lot to, to say in terms of understanding. Um, you can't just switch the two parts here because then they'll lead the confusion of uh, variable and set. Like this is one of the things that helps you see uh, what the difference is. You know, when you see variable and set before the colon, think type 1. When you see variable and set after the colon, think type 2. The other thing is, right here, this is a condition, right? x squared plus 1 less than 30 is going to be either true or false, depending on the value of x. But over here, 10x plus 3, that's not something that's either going to be true or false, right? That's going to be a number, isn't it? I mean, well, look, if we kind of hint at x should be an integer, so x is a number, maybe x is 4, then this is 10 times 4 plus 3, 43. That would just be a number. So that's not true or false. That's not a condition. Like over here, x squared plus 1 less than 30, that's going to be something once we process it and understand, we'd either say is true or false. Right here, this is an expression. I mean, like it's a value. It's a number, right? So these these really look different. And um, an expectation um, that you'll need to have for yourself throughout this semester um, is that when you encounter any set, you have to carefully determine which format it's in. So as far as how do we tell these two apart, um, those were really the comments already. You're looking for uh, the format of variable in set, and if you see that before the colon, think type 1. If you see that after the colon, think type 2. If after the colon you see a thing that's true or false, that could be considered, you know, it's either going to be true or false dependent on the value of the variable, then that's definitely type 1. And if before the colon you see something that's not going to be a true or false, right, what it really is just going to be is it's going to be a value. It might be you know, the value of a real number, it could be a vector, it could be a matrix, you know, then, then you should be thinking, oh, that must be a type 2 set. All right, you always have to carefully determine this. Letting go of this and just not having this as part of your radar is going to cause problems all throughout the semester. So please just, uh, I cannot stress how important it is to have this as your expectation to go, you know, these look similar, don't they? They look super similar if you don't know what you're looking out for. Um, because of the colon in the middle, 
there's a part in front of the colon, there's a part after the colon, there's notation all over the place, there's curly brace. These just look similar. So you got to know what to look for, and you always have to determine which format your set is in for all kinds of reasons. I'll just state right now, it's because these two things are read extremely differently. These are read totally differently. Set A and set B are read totally differently from each other. We'll talk about how in just a moment, but that's all the more reason why you have to be careful when you look at a set that's written, which format really is it in. And the other thing is, if they're if they're written differently or they're read differently, if you interpret what they're they're saying differently, then what, how you manipulate um, something belonging to the set or not, that also is going to be very different for both types. All right, one comment before we go further is that where you see the colon here and here, that could be replaced with a vertical bar. Instead, there's absolutely no change in meaning by doing so. So the set that's up here, I really just copy pasted it down here and I just changed the colon to a vertical bar. And you'll note, I still called this A equals, right? So, because there, this is no different. So don't 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 read into it too much. You do need a separating symbol, whether it is a colon or a vertical bar. But beyond that, um, you can mix it up. Some people just prefer always using colons. Some people always prefer using vertical bars. Some people just mix it up. Um, I tend to use the vertical bar thing, but not if the thing right after is going to mention absolute value, because it just looks confusing. Or maybe if the thing right after is going to mention the number one, then I'm usually using the colon, right? So um, same deal here. For the set B, the colon that's in the middle could be switched out with a vertical bar instead. All right. So let's then t uh, focus in on type 1 and just talk about how to read it. So I just copied the set, uh, the type 1 set that was on the previous slide. And I just, before we dig any further, should mention, you know, this same set could be written differently just like this, right? So this is no different. Um, X here is really a variable after all. So this placeholder variable X and X, if it was just a Y and a Y, this is the same. So these are two um, different looking descriptions of the same set, but they're really describing exactly the same set. So they're no different at all. How do we read this? It's saying for an object to belong to A, what has to happen is that object, I mean, that's why it doesn't matter what letters here, but that thing, for, some, for an object to belong to A, that object must be in Z, and in addition, that object squared plus one must be less than 30. Okay, so let's, um, and I again, I just want to mention in the first way we wrote the set A, X is the variable in the second version that we wrote A in, uh, Y is the variable. So for some examples, 5 is in A because um, 5 is in Z and because 5 squared plus 1 is less than 30. And you see you could plug in 5 for um, X, uh, it, both places X occurs, or if you look at the second line, you could plug in uh, 5 in both places where Y occurs. And just ask, is 5 in Z true? Yes. Is 5 squared plus 1 less than 30 true? Yes. Okay, so 5 is in A. 6 is not in A um, because, well, well, the 6 in Z part is true. The 6 squared plus 1 less than 30 part is false. Pi is not in A because though the second part is true, like pi squared plus 1 is less than 30, the problem now is that the pi in Z, that part is false. So I hope uh, by seeing uh, the example here and the two non-examples, you're getting a good sense of how we should really, really read this set. I'm trying to do this concretely through some examples. So now, based on how we should read this set, again, same same set notation from earlier, how do we use C in A? So you might, at some point through uh, your proof, you might have to have just C as an A. Maybe because, maybe because you were trying to prove a statement that started for all C in A, maybe, right? So you would have then written let C in A, period. And then, after that, what do you get? from Now that you know that C is an A, what new fact do we get? Well, then we can conclude that C is in Z. And we can also conclude that C squared plus 1 is less than 30. Right? So I hope that makes sense. And that, and that seems reasonable based on what we had just seen. In fact, on the previous slide, we saw that 5 was in the set. So we don't just want to assume that little c is 5. But the fact that we're saying C is in Z and that whatever c is, squared plus 1 is less than 30, you know, that, that works. It, it's in harmony with how we had just said 5 could very well have been the element in a, but it could have been 4, 
you know, little c could have been four, little c could have been three. So, so the, these are the right things to conclude, right? It's really just the part that's here um, between the curly brace and the colon, and then the part right after the colon and right before the next curly brace. It's those parts where the variable x, you just substitute the constant c. Okay, so that's how you should use C as an A, but as far as how to use C in A, here's a common mistake that occurs. What often people will do is they'll just write something like this. And I will say that if you just write this as part of your proof, that did not do anything. Because if you'll note, you should really just have C as in Z, period, kind of its own sense. So, so we conclude that C is in Z. We also know or we also conclude c squared plus 1 less than 30. When it's written in the set notation, this isn't doing anything. All that happened here was that the set a was just redescribed, now using c as a variable, right? So, so this doesn't do anything. You just really want the two parts of that written outside of set notation. So you've got to know how to um, read the set notation, but at some point what you're writing itself is not set notation. Now, how do you prove that? C is an A. Maybe you have to prove C is an A. Well, that's just actually all this in reverse. So then you actually have to just once first prove that C is in Z, and then also prove that C squared plus 1 is less than 30. And once you have proved those two things, then you can conclude that C is an A. So it's really just a complete reverse of how to use C as an A. That's fantastic. Using C as an A, proving C is an A, they're, they're um, just kind of exact reverse processes of, of each other. Or here's a different way to say it. C is an A if and only if C is in Z and C squared plus 1 is less than 30. Okay, so that's um, everything about type 1 sets in a nutshell. What about type 2? So let's go back to that set from the one of the earlier slides. This was that type 2 set. First we should talk about how to read this. It's read totally differently. Okay, so, oh, by the way, here's the same set. Um, so I changed out the x variable, the two places that occurred with y. I also, just for fun, replaced the colon with a vertical bar, right? So it, it really is the same set. It's described slightly differently, right? It looks just slightly different, but it really is the same, okay? Um, and so I hope even talking about how these really are the same it helps to even, if I go back, describe even further why this didn't do anything, right? So this is just re-describing the set A. So going back here, okay. So how do we read this? So this time you have to look at the text that's after the colon or the vertical bar first and say this. Each time we select an element of Z, okay, every time we select an element of Z, let's call that thing that's selected, let's call it X, then 10X plus 3 belongs to B, is an element of B, is a member of B. Or if you want to try to read it forward, I, 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 I suggest you don't, but just to try to clarify what we're saying here. Um, in other words, here, here it is. What, what's in B? What, what is an element of B? Elements of B are of the form 10x plus 3, as long as we remember that the x that appears here, here, x really has to be in Z. So let's, let's do this. By selecting x equals 2, we see that 23 is in B. By selecting x equals 5, we see that 53 is in B. Hope that makes sense so far. And if so, I'd just like to ask this quick question and then ask you to think about, is 93 in B? And we'll say yes, right? Because we can find an x in Z such that 93 equals 10x plus 3. In fact, we know that that x in this case uh, should be 9. Right? And then we can ask, is 94 in B? And the point is, uh, well, no. There is no x in Z, anyway, such that 94 is equal to 10x plus 3. There isn't an integer that's going to do this, not a whole number. There is a rational number, there's a real number that will do this, but not a whole number, right? Not an integer. Okay, and then just one more. Is negative 7 in B? And yeah, we can find an x that in the set of integers, so we can find an integer value of x so that negative 7 is equal to 10x plus 3. Namely, the value of x here would have to be negative 1, right? So then we'll have 3 minus 10. Okay, so I hope by doing what we did here, 
going through some concrete examples, you really see exactly what the heck this set notation is. And really pause to think about how this type 2 set, how you read it, is really different from type 1. So here's that set again, uh, the original way we described the set B. And now let's talk about how do you use C and B. Maybe you have to prove, you know, for all C and B, da 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 da. So then you would, your proof would have started, let C and B, period. And then, because you know C is in B, what do you get? Then, if you have C is in B, period, your next sentence could be, therefore, there exists an X in Z such that C, that was this here, is equal to 10x plus 3. That's the text that's right there. Now, this would be how you'd write it if x was not yet used in your proof. Um, if you've got x up in the set description, fine. Or, or may, maybe, you know, you already used x in your proof earlier. Then you could have, if x was used, then you could maybe use a y. If that's available, you could have said, con uh, we conclude that there exists a y in z such that c is equal to 10y plus 3. One thing to really note here is that this is really different from how things happen with type 1. So the set B itself up here, it never says there exists. There's no words that there exists. There's no backwards capital E, right? That, but it's part of our conclusion. It's right here or in the form of a symbol right there. So this kind of thing never happened in type 1, right? In type 1, um, if we go back real quick, sorry to do this. There is no, there exists anywhere here. So yeah, it wasn't up in the set description, but it didn't become part of what happened to use C as an A or to prove C as an A. When we come over here, though it's not, there's no there exists here, just like with set A, it's part of uh, our the text we write in to our conclusion. And that's required, okay? Um, Finally, how do you prove that C is in B? Uh, fortunately, just like with type 1 sets, it's just the reverse of what happened right here. So after you prove there exists X and Z such that C is equal to 10X plus 3, then you can conclude that C is in B, right? So to say it this way, based on how this set is written, this description, I would say that C is in B if and only if there exists an X in Z, right? There exists an X in Z, such that c is equal to 10x plus 3.